Good afternoon, everybody. Um, we're going to go ahead and get started. I, I think that perhaps there's still people joining us, but we do want to make sure that we have time for um, both a full lecture, but also a very nice question and answer period. So um, I would like to welcome everybody. I am Susan Collins, the Joan and Sanford Wild Dean of the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. And I'm really delighted to see all of you here with us this afternoon. Um, it's an honor and a personal pleasure for us to welcome Marion Wright Edelman to campus and to the Ford School for our 2009 Citigroup Foundation Lecture Series. Uh, this lecture series was established several years ago by a gift in honor of President Gerald R. Ford from the Citigroup Foundation. Uh, we're very grateful to the Foundation for their generous gift, which has enabled us to bring distinguished policy leaders and thinkers to campus, and we're particularly honored to have uh, Marian Wright Edelman as part of that series here today. Um, this event is co-sponsored by the National Poverty Center and by the Students of Color in Public Policy, and I want to thank both of those organizations. We're very thankful for their help and support. Uh, today's lecture represents the Ford School's contribution to the University of Michigan's 2009 symposium in honor of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. As you know, or as you may know, the theme for the 2009 University Symposium is a dreamer, but not the only one. This theme was selected to highlight the critical importance of acting for positive change, which King did and which so many of his followers have continued to do in the fight for civil rights and social justice. It's particularly an appropriate theme given the historic election of this nation's first African-American president, Barack Obama, and the unusual challenging times that we currently face. We are all called upon to act, roll up our sleeves and do what we can to create positive change for our community. In Mrs. Edelman's latest book, which we've distributed here this afternoon, she recounts advice that Indira Gandhi remembers hearing from her grandfather. He told her that there were two kinds of people, those who do the work and those who take the credit. <laughs> and I must say that was one of, my, one of many favorite passages I had when I had the pleasure of reading the book recently. Um, he recommended that she try to be in the first group because there was much less competition. <laughs> well, Marion Wright Edelman's life has exemplified a willingness to do the work. The Children's Defense Fund, which she founded in 1973, sprang directly from the Civil Rights Movement and represented her commitment to extending the principles of that movement to children's issues. Some of you might know that it was um, Marion Wright Edelman and her colleagues at the CDF who first popularized the phrase, or I should say the mission, leave no child behind. They've worked tirelessly for that cause through education, prenatal health care and nutrition, high quality affordable daycare, tax relief for working families with young children, adolescent pregnancy prevention, and much more. And all of these policy areas have been shaped and sharpened over the decades by the hard work of Mrs. Edelman and the Children's Defense Fund. Mrs. Edelman is a graduate of Spelman College and Yale Law School, and she began her career in the mid-1960s as the first black woman admitted to the Mississippi Bar. She directed the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund office in Jackson, Mississippi. In 1968, she moved to Washington, D.C. as counsel for the Poor People's Campaign that Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. began organizing before his death. She founded the Washington Research Project, a public, public interest law firm that was the parent body of the Children's Defense Fund. She's received many honorary degrees and awards, including one from University of Michigan's Law School, and in 2000 received the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the nation's highest civilian award, and the Robert F. Kennedy Lifetime Achievement Award for her writings, which include eight books. Like King, and Obama, Marion Wright Edelman is an inspiration who, through decade, for, who for decades, through her words and her actions, has articulated and fought as a champion for justice and a committed activist for positive change. Her work continues to remind us that individuals matter and that we each have a role to play. And her work continues to remind us how important public policy is for setting the stage in which dreams can be realized. With this 2009 theme, a dreamer but not the only one, I can think of no one more appropriate or inspiring to deliver the Ford School's Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. address this year. Please join me in welcoming Marion Wright Edelman.
Thank you. Thank you very much. I love being here at this transformative time in American history. Um, I'm proud of America, as I've always said, more proud than I've ever been. And now I want us to be even prouder as we together come together as citizens to build a movement to make our new great leader realize what we've got to do and which Dr. King hoped for, that is an effort to put the social and economic underpinnings beneath every human being in America and every child. So what a moment this is to be alive. I thank Dean Collins um, for that wonderful introduction. Um, I've worked for years with Sheldon Danziger and really happy to reconnect with that center. And I've met some of your young people from your um, students of color, and so I'm glad to see all of you here at this incredible time of challenge and hope. Um, and I know Dr. King is smiling. I've been wearing my Harriet Tubman and Sojourner Truth medals with me. They've been having the best time since the Democratic <laughs> Convention. Um, and I often think, what would they be doing today? Um, and I know that they would be speaking up to make sure that all the inequalities that have grown and grown um, would be closing and that we'd be about the business of freeing all of our children from poor health and illiteracy and the prison pipeline, and that's what we must be doing. The day he died, Dr. King called his mother from Memphis to give her his next sermon's title for the next Sunday. And it was why America may go to hell. And he said America is going to hell if we don't use her vast resources to end poverty and to make it possible for all of God's children to have the basic necessities of life. And I don't have any doubt that if Dr. King were present today that he would be calling for a poor people's campaign, for a poor children's campaign. When he died, there were 11 million poor children, and today there are 13.3 million poor children. Our GDP is three times bigger than it was when he died. The gap between rich and poor is higher than it's ever been in our recorded history, and I know what he would be doing, and that's what I think we should be doing, because so many of us love to celebrate Dr. King, but it is really now time to follow him and to hear him, and that is the chore for the next eight to 10 years and with this wonderful new moment in American history, with this wonderful new leader. Um, this is our opportunity. Um, and Dr. King from the beginning realized that movements make leaders, citizens make great leaders, not leaders the other way around. And so we have got to make sure that we start that hard work of movement building and carry over the enthusiasm and the organizing efforts and the, the call and respond to the call for community and unity that will enable our president to be the great president he wants to be, but, but we must help him. I tell the story a lot um, that there are no friends in politics, and I tell the story about A. Philip Randolph going to the White House to visit President Franklin Roosevelt, and he was telling him about racial discrimination, the need to have federal action against that. And early on, before the 63 March on Washington, he was talking about a march on Washington to deal with the educational inequities and to deal with job discrimination and job needs of the black community. And President Roosevelt is alleged to have said, and listened very sympathetically, and then to have said at the end of the conversation that, Phil, I agree with absolutely everything that you've just told me. Now you go out and make me do it. So our job, over the next four to eight years is to make our political leaders do what they need to do for the least among us um, and to invest in our human capital, which is going to be the key to America's global competitiveness, because there's so many things on the table, with two wars to solve, with an economic debacle that we're trying to solve, with global warming, with pollution, and all the big things. We've got to make sure the children and the poor stay at the table and that we build a mighty noise to make sure that we create a level playing field. That's what Dr. King would be doing today, and that's what I'm gonna be doing, and forever. Um, uh, the day after Dr. King died, there was rioting and looting all across the nation, and I went out into the District of Columbia Public Schools to tell young people not to riot and not to loot, because I didn't want them to ruin their futures, and a little boy, about 12, looked me straight in the eye and said, lady, what future? I ain't got no future, I ain't got nothing to lose. And I have spent the last 40 years trying to prove that boy's truth wrong. I never realized how hard it would be. And the richest nation on earth that professes to 
have a creed of equality for everybody um, in a democracy, but we've got to answer that boy's truth, and that's what I want to talk about today. Imagine God visiting our very wealthy family, blessed with six children. Five of them have enough to eat and comfortable warm rooms in which to sleep. One doesn't. She's often hungry and cold, and on some nights she has to sleep on the streets or in a shelter and even be taken away from her neglectful family and placed in foster care or group homes with strangers. Imagine this rich family giving five of its children nourishing meals three times a day and snacks to fuel boundless energy, but sending the sixth child to the table in the school hungry with only one or two meals and never the dessert the other children enjoy. Imagine this very wealthy family making sure five of its children get all of their shots, regular health checkups before they get sick, and immediate access to health care when illness strikes, but ignoring the sixth child, who is plagued by chronic respiratory infections and painful toothaches, which sometimes abscess and kill for lack of a doctor or a dentist. Imagine this family sending five of their children to good stimulating preschools and making sure they have music and swimming lessons after school, sending the chick's child to unsafe daycare with untrained caregivers, responsible for too many children, or leaving her occasionally with an accommodating relative or a neighbor or even all alone. Imagine five of the children living in homes with books and families able to read to most of their children every night but the other child will leave left unread to, untalked and unsung to, unhugged or propped before a television screen or video game that feeds him violence and sex and racially and gender charged messages, intellectual pablum interrupted only by ceaseless ads for material things that are beyond the child's grasp. Imagine this family sending some of their children to high quality schools and safe neighborhoods with enough books and computers and laboratories and science equipment and well-prepared teachers and sending the sixth child to a crumbling school building with peeling ceilings and leaks and lead in the paint and asbestos and old, old books and not enough of them and teachers untrained in the subjects they teach and with low expectations that all children can learn, especially the sixth child. Imagine most of the family's children being excited about learning and looking forward to finishing high school, going to the University of Michigan and getting a job, and the sixth child falling further and further behind grade level, not being able to read, wanting to drop out of school, and being suspended and expelled at younger and younger ages. Because no one has taught him to read and compute or diagnosed his attention deficit disorder or treated his health and mental health problems and helped him keep up with his peers. Imagine five of the children engaged in sports and music and arts and after school and summer camps and in enrichment programs and the sixth child hanging out with peers or going home alone because mom and dad are working or are in prison or have run away from their parenting responsibilities and escaped in drugs and alcohol, leaving him alone or on the streets during the non-school hours and weeks, long non-school hours and weeks and months, at risk of being sucked into illegal activities in the prison pipeline or killed in our gun-saturated nation. Well, this is our American family today, where one in six of our children lives in poverty in the richest nation on earth. More than 40% live in extreme poverty, and the numbers of 13.3 and 5.6 in extreme poverty are going to get worse in this period of downturn. Our data is old. And it is not a stable or a healthy um, or economically sensible or just family. Our failure to invest in all of our children before they get sick or drop out of school, get pregnant or get into trouble, is morally indefensible and extremely costly. Every year we let 13 million children live in poverty, costs about a half trillion dollars in lost productivity and the cost of crime and health and other dependency. You cannot hurt others, especially children, without consequences. And contrary to popular stereotypes, America's sixth child is more than twice as likely to live in a working family than to be on welfare, is more likely to be white than black or Latino, and is more likely to live in a rural or suburban area than in an inner city. However, black and Hispanic children are at far greater risk of being poor and of entering the cradle to prison pipeline. 
the most dangerous place for a child to grow up in America today is at the intersection of poverty and race. Racial disparities still permeate all the major American institutions that shape the life chances of millions of children. Undergirded by poverty, these disparities are putting countless children at risk of incarceration and funneling hundreds of thousands of them every year into a pipeline to prison, derailing their chances for reaching successful adulthood. Incarceration is becoming the new American apartheid, and poor children of color are the father. All of us must see and understand and sound the alarm about this threat to American unity and community, act to stop the growing criminalization of children at younger and younger ages, and tackle the unjust treatment of minority youths and adults in the juvenile and adult criminal justice systems with urgency and persistence. The failure to act now will reverse the hard-earned racial and social progress Dr. King and so many others died and sacrificed for and weaken our future capacity to lead. All leaders in all sectors must call for investment in all children from birth through their successful transition to adulthood, remembering Frederick Douglass's correct observation that it is easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. So many poor babies in rich America enter the world with multiple strikes against them, born without prenatal care at low birth weight and to a teen, poor and poorly educated single mother and absent father, though I do hope that this, the signal of our new president says you can make it even if your daddy did leave home when you were two and even if your mother was on food stamps and even if you did have an unstable, mobile childhood. But we can't just say, children, you go do it. You've got to put into place the building blocks so that they can actually succeed. And I love, I told the story earlier this morning, being in a juvenile detention center a few weeks ago, and I asked a young man what this election meant. And one young man, about 15, who had, was in there for very serious things, said, you know, a week ago, I couldn't even imagine getting my GED. Now I'm going to hang in there and get my PhD. So hope has been aroused. But we've got to make sure he has the tools and the means to get that G PhD. And so let's put the building blocks and meet on the hope that will allow our children to succeed now that their expectations and sense of themselves has been lifted. At crucial points in their development after birth until adulthood, more risks pile on, making a successful transition to productive adulthood significantly less likely and involvement in the criminal justice system significantly more likely. Since children of color are always and have been always disproportionately poor, their odds of incarceration as adults greatly exceed that of white children. Black children are three times as likely as white children to be poor and are almost six times as likely as white children to be incarcerated. A poor black boy born in 2001 has a one in three chance of going to prison in his lifetime. A Latino boy, a one in six chance. A black girl and a white boy, a one in 17 chance. A Latina girl, one in 45 chance. White girl, a one in 111 chance. The past continues to strangle the present and the future. Children with an incarcerated parent are more likely to become incarcerated. Black children are nearly nine times, and Latino children three times as likely as white children to have an incarcerated parent. Blacks constitute one-third and Latinos one-fifth of our imprisoned population. One in three black men, 20 to 29 years old, the fathers of children that need them and home and able to provide the nurturing care, is under correctional supervision or control. Of the 2.3 million people in jail or prison, 64% are minority. Of the 4.2 million people on probation, 45% are minority. And of the 800,000 people on parole, 59%. We're not in a post-racial society yet, but we've got to get there. And for any of us who thought that the change at the top, which is so crucial, has got to solve all the problems of those um, at the bottom, um, and which have been deepening, and the downward mobility has been increasing over the last decades, need to address this, and this is the time to take this new era and this new leadership to really make sure that we lift um, the bottom and create a level of playing field for all of our children. Unjust drug sentencing policies have greatly escalated. 
the incarceration of minority adults and youths. Now these numbers that I've just shared um, are a black and Latino community tragedy, but they are an unfolding national catastrophe that we've got to address. They are ripping apart millions of families, stripping away the right to vote for many, and blocking the chance to get a job to support a family. They decrease public security as more and more prisoners re-enter society without the means to legally support themselves. And they drain taxpayer dollars as increasing billions are spent on massive incarceration of young and old. We need to change course. Our states are spending on average three times more per prisoner than per public school pupil. I can't think of a dumber investment policy. And I'm delighted that your new governor is trying to begin, your governor, she's not new anymore, um, is trying to begin to change and reorder these priorities. Please support her um, and speak up against the growing power of the prison unions and of the prison industrial complex. Um, prisons are big business. We're spending $200 billion a year. We have more people. Um, they're, they're, they employ more people than our three largest employers, Walmart, GM, and so recently GM and Ford. Um, this is big, big business. And I tell you, as I get older, I want to make sure that they're, I, we're producing enough productive workers to support us and our older ages and, and, and the infrastructure we need to be strong in the new centers and us supporting them. Um, in prison at, at, at a greatly increased cost. We can redevelop. We've got a paradigm change that we all need to sort of call for, and we need to stop incarceration as a first resort and really begin to invest preventively and, 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 and early in trying to divert our children into a pipeline to successful adulthood through college and to productive work. And I think that is the agenda for us, for the Children's Defense Fund, for the next decade and for all of us. Um, we need to create that level playing field. Now, child poverty and neglect and the cradle to prison pipeline and the racial disparities in the systems that serve our children are not acts of God. They are America's immoral political and economic choices that can and must be changed with strong political corporate community leadership. No single sector or group can solve these child and nation threatening crises alone, but all of us can together. As leaders, we must all begin to come to the table and use our pulpits and our skills um, to replace our current paradigm with, again, a paradigm of prevention and investment in children before they get sick and drop out of school and get into trouble. It will save lives, it will save families, it will save taxpayer money, it will save our nation's aspiration to be a fair society, and it will allow us to compete in the global arena where our children are going to have to have the skills and the means to maintain our economic saliency with competition from China and India and Europe and everywhere. We can no longer afford to waste our children. And it is time for us to live up to our creed. And that is, again, the goal of this time. Ending child poverty is not only a, an urgent moral necessity. It's economically beneficial, as Dr. Solo, MIT Nobel Laureate in Economics, wrote in Wasting America's Future. I think Sheldon Danzka was a member of that effort. And he said that ending child poverty is, at the very least, highly affordable. More likely, it is a gain to the economy and to the businesses, taxpayers, and citizens within. A healthy Social Security, and that ends Dr. Solo's quote, but I say a healthy Social Security and Medicare system for our increasing elderly population needs as many productive workers as possible, and we can ill afford to let millions of our people and children grow up poor and poor health, uneducated, undereducated, and as dependent rather than productive citizens. So what can we all do today as community and other leaders to build our spiritual and political will to help our nation pass, pass the test of the God of history and better prepare for America's futures? What steps can we take together to heed Dr. King's warning not to let our wealth become our destruction but our salvation by helping the poor Lazaruses languishing at our gates? How can we seize the enormous opportunity today to use our great blessings to bless all the children entrusted to our care and rekindle America's dimming dream? Well, the first is for all of us 
to be leaders in our community and in our networks and in our disciplines that call all of us to our best selves. And he, the president, called for all of us to create a new ethic of caring and sacrifice and service. And we must begin at every level to try to overcome the deep divides between rich and poor and white and non-white and men and women and imprisoned and free. And, but despite the huge strides over the past decades, we really are seeing our social and economic progress stalling. Again, at the top, it's been wonderful, and threatening to reverse. And we've got to get ourselves on the right track again. We've got to move forward and not backwards. We've got to reset our nation's priority that have created that greatest gap between rich and poor in our history and between our rich and poor in the globe because we really are one big human house and everything is interconnected as Dr. King told us over and over again. And we've got to step off, go away from the false either ors. And the president mentioned a number of them, but I say the false either ors between personal, family, community, and societal responsibility for children. And from simplistic solutions that don't address these complex but solvable problems. Since all of us are responsible, for ensuring our nation's future. All of us need to come together to work together across discipline, across race, across income, and to put our children's healthy development at the center of our decision making. Because if the child is safe, everybody is safe. And the child doesn't come in pieces. The child comes in families. Families are affected by communities. Communities are affected by the policies and the investment priorities of their state and local and national governments. And all of us are affected by the culture that seems to glorify violence and excessive materialism and militarism, which Dr. King warned us about. And these have to be seen in context um, because they are all affecting our children's healthy development. The second is that I just hope we will all come together and really envisage that we can eliminate poverty and eliminate child poverty in this country, starting with extreme child poverty. And wouldn't it be nice if we set a goal for 2015, which is the date of the United Nations Millennial Goals for lifting um, many, many millions out of poverty in, in developing nations around the world, but what an example we might show. Um, I remember how heartbroken I was at a UNICEF meeting some years ago when I was sharing with them the, the facts of child um, poverty and mortality and morbidity in our country and the developing nations were absolutely crushed because they thought, my goodness, if we could just become like the United States, if we could just become a developed nation, these problems would disappear. I really want us to be a good role model. I mean, it's just, we, we need to show that democratic capitalism is not an oxymoron and so it would be so wonderful if while and we're losing ground on these millennial development goals, if we could set a goal that says we're going to eliminate child poverty, and I, I'm always in a hurry because children are growing up. They have only one childhood. I think we've lost two generations of many of our poor and minority children by 2015, and we all made a commitment and got our leaders to make a commitment to doing what we have to do to end the racial disparity suffered by millions of black, Latino, Native, Native American children who are disproportionately poor in the richest nation on earth. No other rich, industrialized Western nation permits the high rates of child poverty that we do. No other nation lets children be the poorest group among its citizens. We can do better. Benjamin Franklin said a long time ago that the best family policy is a good job. Every American family should have an adequate income based primarily on work and a decent safety net for anyone unable to work and everyone must be able to live in healthy, safe, job-rich communities with affordable housing. And I don't want to hear anybody tell us we don't have the money to do it, even in this period of economic downturn. Every child could be lifted out of poverty for less than nine months of the tax cuts for the top 1%, and four months of this Iraq war. I was trying to convince the Congress that we really could afford $70 billion last year to cover all of our children rather than four of the nine million uninsured children and to provide that national safety net. And they said we couldn't find the money. We were too poor. And look how quickly they found that $700 billion. And what are we talking about now? Um, we don't have a money problem. We have a values and a priorities problem. And again, the job of citizens is to make a mighty noise for a change in our investment priorities. And I hope that you will join me in that we can begin to stop the irresponsible giveaways to our richest 300,000 Americans and reinvest that in saving the futures of 13 million poor children. And I hope we will do that and fight hard 
for the tax relief for low and moderate income families, including a fully refundable child tax credit, which is in the House stimulus bill, and I hope you will pay attention to what's in that bill, because the first thing we can do is to make sure that the investments in low income people at this time and middle income people at this time really get put into that stimulus package, which gives us something to build on when the temporary period expires. But making the tax, child tax credit fully refundable will, will benefit millions of children and lift hundreds of thousands of them out of poverty now. Getting um, the earned income tax credit expanded um, for larger families with three or more children, again, would have an enormous anti-poverty impact. Investing in child care and food stamps for all of our folk, would, they're going to spend that money quickly, they're going to stimulate the economy, and they're going to hopefully keep themselves together. But there are a lot of strong safety net programs, expansion of Medicaid um, and state assistance, but pay attention to it. The House package, I think, on the whole is very good. Now, keeping it in the Senate is going to be a, a challenge, but let's work on that because this is a time when we have a chance to move forward. Um, if we lifted, if we expanded ch federal child care support to families earning 200% or below the federal level, we could lift over 2 million children out of poverty. If we raise food stamp participation, increase the benefit to 85%, we could again have an impact on millions. So here is a moment that we must seize, and I do hope that you will call up your senators now and call up your congressmen now and really support the provisions that are in the House package. I hope we all will take responsibility to educate ourselves and to educate others about who the poor are. And maybe in this period of economic downturn, when many people who thought they'd never be in a food stamp line, never thought they'd lose their home, never thought they'd be wondering where they're going to be able to pay their utilities bill, that this is a moment when we might be open and that the poor may well be us. We must help our nation remove their, our psychological cataracts and dispel many of the myths that we so often hear about the causes and consequences of child poverty, one of which I've already talked about. It costs too much to eliminate poverty. I think we need to change the terms of the debate. It says it costs too much to maintain child poverty. We need to produce productive citizens, not um, dependent ones. Um, we hear a lot about it's not the right time. Um, it's always the right time. Um, to be just and to be fair and to make sure that children are able to get the very basic things they need to grow up and to learn and to be healthy. We hear still that nothing works. Well, um, we know a lot about work, um, things that do work. We know how to immunize children. We should not have so many children that are not immunized today. We know how to provide good health services for children. There should not be nine million children unable to find a dentist or a doctor. We know a lot about what works. We need to move them to scale and to maintain their quality. We know that um, we can overcome some of the myths like, you know, we fought a war in poverty and poverty won. Well, we didn't fight a war in poverty. We fought a scrimmage on poverty and the war in Vietnam and the military budget won. Dr. King was calling for a poor people's campaign at a time when we were investing 40 times less in the Office of Economic Opportunity to fight the war in poverty than the war in Vietnam and other military spending. He knew this was an unequal contest and we need to go back again. I mean, he would not be pleased today to see that we're in two wars and the trillions have gone into wars rather than into investing in our people. These are about making hard choices and we need to answer them back. We often hear that it's parents' responsibility to take care of their own children. They're not my children, they're other people's children. Well, of course it's parents' responsibility. But what are parents to do if, if um, their jobs are um, down or, or eliminated or are sent abroad, um, our wages are there, they're working as hard as they can, but they cannot lift themselves out of poverty. Or if they're not um, able to get health care, the majority, 90% of the, of the children of of, without health insurance are living in families playing by the rules, but again, can't get health care. Um, and so while parents certainly should be the first line of responsibility, no child should be punished for parents they did not choose. And if you look at the book that you've been handed, you will find I'm pretty tough on parents, but we need to also support parents in being good parents. Um, and nobody raises a child alone. They say that the poor should not have babies. They can't support. Nobody should have babies. They can't support, either financially or emotionally. But again, you don't punish children um, for the problems of the parents they did not choose. And we need to help rather than judge or blame or punish the poor, non-poor who neglect their children. 
and I hear a lot about class warfare, even from dear friends um, who are concerned about children but don't really want to talk about changing our tax policies. Um, and I don't want to hear anybody talk about class warfare when we have seen how we've had this massive redistribution of income from the poor to the rich over the last decades. And, and corporate welfare um, has been extraordinary. Something is wrong and unfair when 46 companies in a recent year paid no federal income taxes while reporting combined profits of 40, almost $43 billion and collectively receiving tax rebates totaling $5.4 billion. We need to have a little tax fairness here. Um, and we've always tended to have socialism for the rich, as we're seeing now in the bailouts, um, and capitalism for the poor. We need to have better balance as we move forward. So that three in terms of public policy opportunities this year, which require voice, and we do know what to do, is that I hope that we can all come together and see health insurance coverage for every American. But if we can't get it for every American, and I hope we will, and we must work hard, I hope we can get it for every child and every pregnant mother. The Senate today is considering CHIP. I haven't been informed about whether, in fact, they ended up passing it. Um, the House had passed the state children's health insurance bill that Mr. Mr. Bush had vetoed several times last year. But that is not child health reform. It's a step forward. That's last year's unfinished business. It covers only four if the Senate does end up including, as the House did not, legal immigrant children. Um, but it's about four million children. But we're nine million uninsured children, and we want them all having a health safety net. I said to them, until I'm doing the base, I have three sons, and I wouldn't dream of giving one of them health coverage and two of them no health coverage. Um, we can do better. And there, God did not make two classes of children, and this country can afford to cover all children. We can afford to give them all the same guaranteed package of comprehensive benefits, which include mental and dental. We have children dying from tooth abscesses in this country. We shouldn't have that happen. I don't want to hear those Katrina children's problems over the next years as we've left them out there three years after this great trauma without the mental health care needs. I don't want to see children sitting up by the thousands in our juvenile detention facilities solely because they couldn't get mental health coverage in their community and parents having to judge themselves neglectful and abusive parents in order to get mental health coverage. We need to put into place comprehensive benefits and we cannot have a two-tier system of children who are eligible for Medicaid, guaranteed comprehensive benefits, in fact, we can, and children for CHIP who don't have guaranteed benefits, which is what we're trying to do is to make sure that we upgrade um, all children to the same set of benefits. You can have two children in the same family of different ages, depending on how the state has structured this child health delivery systems. One is eligible for comprehensive benefit and guaranteed it throughout this economic downturn. The other child may be eligible for CHIP. Um, and um, not guaranteed anything and not have mental or dental. Um, and as children are being cut back now in this economic downturn of states, this two-tier system must be corrected. Every child should have what they need to grow up healthy and to have the full range of comprehensive benefits. The third thing that we're trying to do, and we've drafted a bill that was in last year and which will be reintroduced within this month, is called the All Healthy Children's Act is that we would make sure that we simplify the child health bureaucracies. I don't want to see national health insurance with the seniors having Medicare, and I don't know what we'll end up with for all the rest of us, but the children cannot be left out there in two programs in 50 states. The lottery of geography must end. A Mississippi child's life is no less valuable than a Massachusetts child's life, and a child's chance to live and thrive should not depend on the goodness of their governor, or the politics or wealth of their state, so we want a national safety net that says every child with, in a family with 300% of poverty, income or less, would be given guaranteed these services. Um, and anybody with income above that can be able to buy in at an affordable cost. And we should make it simple. There should be one system so we don't have the current problem with 6 million children of the 9 million who are uninsured are eligible for either CHIP or Medicaid, but they fall through the bureaucratic cracks. And we need to make enrollment automatic at birth, or if any child is in a means-tested program, they're automatically enrolled if they're starting school, but we should make sure we're getting them. We don't need to do all this outreach. We just need to get them in the system. And the, the, the value here is to serve children well and to tear down all these bureaucratic barriers that the states have put up. 
to serve as few children as they can rather than serve as many children. So one of the things I do hope you will do is to have a robust engagement in this new debate that's going on in national health insurance for everybody. But please pay particular attention to um, the children's health piece and to the pregnant women's piece. We want to cover every pregnant woman. It is disgraceful that our low birth weight rates are those of an underdeveloped nation, that our infant mortality rates are those of an underdeveloped nation. And we know how to move this well, but we're going to need your help and your voice. And Senator Stabenow is on the Finance Committee. They're going to have jurisdiction over much of what we need to do for children, whether it's poverty, um, the stimulus package, or whether it's children's health coverage. But I do hope you will pay attention. I hope you will check into our website um, and look at the old health and children's debates. Um, provisions and see how you can support it and encourage other people to support it. We must cover our children. We must close off that first big entry point into the prison pipeline by making sure that those children who were born with three or four strikes against them at low birth weight, we didn't identify that they had a substance or alcohol abusing mother or mother at risk. Um, let's get them on the earth with a fair chance to run. And then let's put in place the second building block, and that's a strong early childhood foundation. We know about early brain, brain development and the importance of the first three years of life, and yet early Head Start serves only 3% of the eligibles. And in this stimulus package, there is a 2.1 billion increase in Head Start, and I hope a lot of that will go into early Head Start. We know how to give good parent support programs, and child-parent interaction is so important, but you can't teach what you don't know. And so this is another set of programs and policies that we need to move to scale. Parents need support. They are eager to be and hungry to do a better job, but they need help, and we need to expand the, the chances for our children to have very strong early childhood experiences. We need to have a universal, high-quality early childhood system with Head Start and child care and preschool, and we need to sort of break down the silos between the child care people and the preschool people and the Head Start people and the after-school people and see if we can't develop a a high quality early childhood system that's going to help children get ready for school and be ready to get and learn in school, but also be safe after school. Children spend only 17% of their time in school. We need to get these congregations, and you will see a very strong set of letters in the book you've got. Please look at it, debate it, and then go and confront your religious leaders and yourselves, um, our neighbors, for how we can begin to reweave the fabric of the community and open up our congregations to provide safe havens to the streets for our children. The gangs and the drug dealers are open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, and the television sets are always on. How do we begin to compete with them and provide positive role models and, and programming for our children? So having a high quality early childhood and family support system, very, very important. And there will be legislation that will be introduced to try to do this. I think we need to ensure child and economic and family security. And I hope, again, you will plug in and look. And I'm sure that your, your leaders here and this school will have a lot to say as we move forward. I hope we can dramatically decrease the number of children coming into the child welfare system. And again, I keep going back to poverty. A poor child is 22 times more likely to be neglected and abused than a non-poor child. And we've got to deal with the core causes and not just with the symptoms. And you know we've got 345,000 places of worship. I've been saying to all of, and I come from a family of Baptist preachers, if just 10% or 15% of them decided they were going to find one or two adoptive parents, we could clean out the child welfare system. Or if we provided adequate support systems for families and kin, um, we could keep a lot of children out of the child welfare system because we know once children go into foster care, they're going to be at risk of dropping out of school with much higher rates than children who have not gone into the foster care system. Um, they're much more at risk of, of going into juvenile detention. So we've got, again, to close off that feeder system, but it's going to take family and community um, and neighbors and, and good public policies um, and, again, an attack on poverty. And I hope that we can begin to deal with our overburdened and underfinanced child welfare system, which is a major feeder system into the cradle to prison pipeline. And I want to give a great shout out to grandparents. I've really been radicalized by becoming grandma. And I am not going to leave this messy world to our grandchildren. And I think that when I look at um, the struggles of grandparents, and there are about 4.5 million children living in grandparent-headed households. And I try to put myself in their place, and I've got every support I need. 
my husband and I can manage, and we have our grandchildren for one whole weekend. We are so worn out when they leave. I just cannot imagine what it's like for these 70, 75, and 80-year-old grandparents trying to deal with children and the, and the loss of their own children for many things. And many of them have special needs, don't have the transportation, don't have the support, don't have the education, don't have the safer communities. I don't know how they manage. And we've been making some progress. There's new legislation to try to begin to bolster grandparents. But again, they need community supports. They need better public policies. We need to try to keep family together for children as much we can as we can. We need to figure out how to educate our children. I mean, I can't figure out how in this wealthy nation that has managed to send spaceships to bars and, and men and women to the moon and crack the genetic code and mine trillions of dollars and I'm talking a tiny microchip. We can't figure out how to teach our children to read by fourth grade or even eighth grade or 12th grade. The majority of all of our children of all races and income groups are not reading at grade level in fourth and eighth grade or 12th grade if they are um, able to have them dropped out by then. And among our minority young people, 80%, over 80% of our young people are not computing at grade level in fourth or eighth or 12th grade if they haven't dropped out. Over 90% are not doing their math at grade level. What is a child to do in this globalizing post-industrial economy, information-based economy, if they can't read or write? They're, they're headed off to prison. They're headed off to death. There's no place for them in this American place, which is why we've got to make our public schools function, have high expectations for every child, hold ourselves accountable um, for ensuring equal educational opportunity, tackle the growing resegregation of our schools, and the, again, the gaps between the quality we're able to give our children rich, I mean, between in Ann Arbor and the children in Flint, but we've got to begin to deal with these basic problems of inequity, have high expectations for all children. I've been so proud that I kept all three of my sons out of law school, and while I think that we, and I try to say that teaching and education is the civil rights issue of, the, of, of, this, of this era. And I applaud those young people who are going into Teach America. I'm so glad that two of my children are invested in education. But we've got to begin to get a hold of these children. We've got to begin to reconceptualize our schools, to have high expectations, um, to have high teacher quality, to reward teachers, and then to hold teachers and principals accountable. Um, and I tell everybody to go into teaching, but don't go into teaching if you don't see it as a mission, if you don't love and respect all children, because you can have the fanciest classrooms and you can have the best laboratories, but if children know you don't love them and expect them to learn, please get out and do something else. But I think what the community needs to have, that we need to have community accountability. Um, we need, when we see, as we're seeing in the Cradle of Prison Pipeline, the transference of zero tolerance drug policies into zero tolerance discipline policies in our schools. And we see five and six and seven year old children being expelled for behaviors that used to be handled in the school principal's office or in the community. And when we see school systems bringing police in to school premises to arrest six and seven, eight year old children, handcuffing them at the ankles and at the I think we adults have lost our minds. And I just was listening to the ACLU in New York recently about school security problems in that city. And the school security force in New York City constitutes the sixth largest police system in our country. After Boston Public School, we have got to stop. We've got to look back and say, what is the purpose of schools? And if we're engaging children, and if we're giving them the supports they need, and if we're collaborating with parents, real parent collaboration, and are trying to make sure that we're building those bridges between early childhood and public schools and after schools, and there are some school systems that are getting it right, and there are a lot of wonderful individual schools in a lot of places. There are not a lot of wonderful school systems that are lifting whole ch sets of children. But we know, we can look at Raleigh, we can look at Long Beach, and there are other places, but we've got to get it right. We've got to figure out in this wealthy, great democracy, how to teach all of our children to read and how to have high expectations. But that's going to come from citizen demand, and we must begin to do it. We've got to reform the juvenile justice system, and I just invite you to go and sit with juvenile judges for a day in court and see the breakdown of the systems and what the, the children who are coming in there, and then to go sit in adult criminal court and see the results of our failures to invest and to reweave the fabric of family and community. And lastly, the least popular political issue I could mention is 
gun violence, violence. I mean, all of these are related, interrelated. I mean, we lose a child to gun violence every three hours, eight a day. We've made progress when we began to do our annual child and gun violence reports. We're losing 15 a day, um, but, and we were going down steadily. We now have an uptick in, in gun violence. Went back up above 3,000, 3,006. Um, since Dr. King died, we've lost 104,000 children to gunfire, and three times as many have been injured by gun violence. Um, we have the equivalent of Virginia Tech's massacre every four days in this quiet, chronic problem of gun violence. And Dr. King and Robert Kennedy warned us about gun violence, and we haven't listened. And so many thousands of our children are living in war zones, living traumatized every day. The stories are just horrendous. And I don't know what it's going to take um, to get us to stand up and say we're going to stop the killing of children in our country and to stop the violence against children in our homes as well as in our streets and neighborhoods. It's very hard um, to focus in class if you're walking through streets and dodging bullets and, 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 and are constantly afraid. And so many of our children are living in constant fear. And if you go into your juvenile detention facilities, you'll find that most of your young people are obsessed with not whether they're going to die, but when they're going to die, and they feel hopeless. Children should not be growing up assuming they're not going to reach adulthood. We can do better. And these challenges are challenges we must make, and we must somehow raise a stronger counter voice to the NRA and say we're going to stop the killing of children. But all of these are interrelated in how we respect and try to create for every child a reasonable and just chance to succeed in our rich democratic nation. I know we can do it. We have seen extraordinary revelation, revolutions um, over our lifetime. I've always felt very blessed, as I say in almost every speech, to have been born who I was, what I was, at the convergence of great events and great leaders. I um, mean, to have the role models of not just the Dr. Kings, and I used to love Dr. King, who never always knew, seldom always, seldom, seldom always, good gracious Mary, who seldom knew <laughs> what the whole staircase was going to look like. And the first speech I heard him make at Spelman College in my senior year was um, how we should all take the first step if you could see the whole stairway and leave the rest to God. And I was always impressed by him because of his doubts and because of his ability to fight and move on despite his fears. And he taught me that courage was not not being afraid. It was going ahead, trying to find the means to act even when you were afraid. And that first speech I remember, he talked about the importance of continuing to move forward despite the political weather, the importance of having thermostat leaders rather than thermometer leaders who stuck their hands up in the air, but we needed thermostat leaders who could change the climate, and the need to speak right. And if you couldn't fly, you should all you should drive. If you couldn't drive, you should run. If you couldn't run, you should walk. If you couldn't walk, you should crawl, but you should keep moving. And there's been a lot of people who kept moving over the last 40 years. It's been a very tough wilderness period. And we're coming out now, and I do hope that we're going to now stand up and build that transforming movement that Dr. King lived and died for. Let me end with a, a poem by Anne Weems called The Greenless Child. Because a lot of our problem in America is this distinction we make between our own people, our own children, and other people's children. Um, I think all children are sacred. I think um, all children are children of God, and that our civil creed, as well as our creed from all great faiths, say um, that the priority should go to the most vulnerable, to the orphans, to the widow. And I hope that this is a time we might be visited. But I was very moved by Anne Weaves' poem about the greenless child. She said, I watched her go and celebrated into the second grade, a greenless child. Gray among the orange and yellow, attached too much to corners and to other people's sunshine. She colors the rainbow brown and leaves balloons unopened in their packages. Oh, who will touch this greenless child? Who will plant alleluias in her heart and send her dancing into all the colors of God? Or will she be left like an unwrapped package on the kitchen table, too dull for anyone to take the trouble? Does God think that we are her keeper? Well, I think so. And I think at this moment that we all have an enormous opportunity to turn this greenless child into a green child full of life by putting into place the kind of community and family supports that every child needs, the role modeling and the mentoring that every child needs, 
um, and putting into place the kind of public policies and new investment policies and new sense of community and unity that makes this child feel welcome at the table of plenty in our rich land. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that inspiring call to action on behalf of our children. Um, Marion White Edelman has agreed to take some questions. We have maybe 25 minutes. Um, what I will ask is uh, if people could come to the microphones. There's one here and there's one there. Um, we have a large audience, which is wonderful, but uh, it means that I'm, I will ask people to introduce themselves very briefly and to try to, to be, be brief with their question as well. Um, so I will come back at uh, 5.30 um, to shift to a reception, um, but if people would approach the microphones. Thank you. Yes. Um, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Good afternoon and welcome to the University of Thank Michigan. You. My name is Audrey. I'm a two-time grad of U of M. Um, I looked through your book and uh, one of the things that impressed me was the mandate that you mentioned uh, for teachers, you know, to treat each child with a sense of equity, uh, regardless of their background. Um, I would like to hear your uh, thoughts on an individual that I've come to admire in this community. Uh, her name is Ruth Zweifler. Uh, she is a woman who, uh, she's of Jewish background, and she adopted uh, children um, who were of a different race. And I personally feel that one of the most concrete ways that we can have an impact on poverty is to do hands-on activities or hands-on intervention to bring people who are different than we are into our personal lives and to begin to understand what their barriers are and to be a support to them to get through those barriers. So I'd like to hear your, um, your thoughts on, on what is required or what is the value of those of us who want to help in this area of reaching out and, and bringing in folks who are different than we are in a very personal way into our lives. Oh, I, I encourage it. I mean, I think that we've, we've um, um, we are one nation. I think that's the, the call and the appeal now. Um, we are all equal um, under our Constitution, at least in theory, even though those of us who are women and those of us who are three-fifths of everybody else. But look at the progress we've made over the last hundred years. We're living in a world, in a nation that is um, already becoming more and more like California and in a world that is two-thirds non-white and two-thirds poor. And one of the great important things about this election is that we're joining the world in a very real way. I had wondered so much about how, whether within 100 years we could restore our sense of respect in the world, but somehow I think that this man who seems to represent the DNA of every piece of the globe, um, um, everybody is able to see something of themselves in him, both if you're a biracial child or if you're, if you're it's, 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 it's a wonderful thing to see it all come together. Um, and uh, there was a big dispute for many years about whether there should be white families adopting black children. Um, I said, well, you know, a good, loving family um, that really cares and respects children is better than any old institution you can find. Um, they need caring adults. They need to be culturally sensitive. But I think we need to clean out our foster care system. We can't find enough adoptive families. Um, you know, we need to do something. We need to get these children out, and we need not to just be adopting children from around the world. So I'm for trying to find all the kinds of ways in which we can begin to get to know each other and work together. Um, 11 o'clock on Sunday morning, as you know, is still the most segregated hour in America, but we've got to find ways of building relationships in the faith community, um, and we need to have freedom schools, which is a model that CDF is pushing. We have 150 of them in black churches and all around the country, but you know, many of them have no money in rural areas, and they can begin to pair up with white churches, and all of us need to figure out how we can pool our resources and find ways of supporting each other to reach the children most in need. Um, just trying to see how you could begin to get churches 
of all colors or synagogues to sort of take responsibility for the churches with children within a five block radius. I and mean, wouldn't it be nice if they just knew the children around them um, and began to figure out how they could begin to open up their doors and provide services. So all these opportunities um, to be a personal witness, and I hope you will look at some of the messages to families and neighbors, neighbors, um, and to congregations and to all of us. But while we're making this personal witness, we also have to make a civic commitment, and we have to be aware of the need for good, just policies. And charity is not a substitute for justice. And personal caring is crucially important, and it's something we should all do, because we care, and we serve, and we're part of a common community. We should also be part of a movement that's going to change the investment cards of the nation. So it's a both and again. But I don't know the person you mentioned, but um, I applaud what she's doing. Hi. Thank you. I can't see very well with the light. Yes, OK. Um, Thank hello, you. Hello, Mrs. Elliman. My name is Shadi Bradford, and we met this summer during the Joshua Ever Generation Conference in Tennessee. Um, I, I was a representative of a foster club, and so I guess um, I think it's fitting to know that since we're on a college campus, I wanted to know if you could talk about what the, what the Children of Fist Fund um, does across the country to engage young people on college campuses. Well, I think that the most important thing all of us can do is to mentor and prepare a critical mass of the next generation to engage in, in ongoing advocacy and to sustain this movement. And, um, the Children's Defense Fund invests an enormous portion of its resources in training young people. Um, we are trying to create not just opportunities to have them meet, but we are trying to also create structures for advocacy and service. They need to have a way of moving up the ladder of leadership and having ongoing ways of staying involved. And so um, we, we bought Alex Haley's farm about 15 years ago. Most of us, most people think of CDF as a national policy group in Washington, and we do do that. Um, but it's about a third of what we do, two thirds of us is out in states and localities and trying to engage in community building. And we've been trying to create new models based some on the 60s, but preparing them in the context of the 21st century movement that we need to build. And so one example is that we've created, we took the Mississippi Freedom Schools of 64, put a real curriculum under it, um, and have created 150 freedom schools, which we now want to move to scale. Um, where we teach young children how five to 15 year olds, but with college student teacher mentors, and a third of them in churches, and a third of them in schools, and a third of them are in a mix of community institutions, and some partners with higher education. Davidson College has one, the University of Maryland, at any rate. Um, but then we try to make sure that the young people, five to 16, become engaged in service. We talk, uh, the theme of Freedom Schools is I can make a difference in myself, in my community, in my family, in my nation, in my world. They have wonderful books that are designed to empower them. They look and study what children did to create, the, help the role that they played in overcoming legal apartheid in this country and the civil rights movement. They learn about Little Ruby Bridges. They learn about the Little Rock Nine. They learn about the children in Birmingham who without them, Dr. King would never have been able to move Birmingham to fruition, and I can't recommend too strongly a look at the Birmingham children's movie, and to look at that. The Southern Poverty Law Center did that piece, and I now make all the adults look at it, because we adults, we tend to be very ahistorical, and we don't know our history, and so it's really important that children and young people see what they did um, to create a new America. But we have a range of children's of youth development programs. We have internship programs for all kinds of folk. We have Beat the Odds celebration of young people who are making it and who are my favorite pool of young leaders. Um, and it just says what a difference one person can make. I mean, these are young people who've gone through violence and homelessness and seen parents kill each other. And somehow a teacher or a counselor or a grandparent or a caring neighbor has been their lifeline to reaffirm that they can make it. And they are now wonderful productive citizens, and there are about 700 of them, and they've gone into the Peace Corps, and they're teaching, and they're social workers, and they're doctors and lawyers. But then we're really trying to make a very big effort to, to draw from different networks, and I'm particularly interested in the faith networks, um, so that we can help faith communities rediscover what it is they say they believe in. And so we've been having the greatest preachers in America. We have what we call the Moses Miriam generation that is um, hopefully um, transforming and working with the Joshua Deborah generation to see if we can't affect the curriculum of divinity schools. But we're having a mass transformation of leadership from Moses to Joshua. 
and from Miriam to Deborah. Many of our major faith institutions in the black community are going now to 30-year-olds and 40-year-old preachers, and they need to rediscover their prophetic voice. And so Alex Haley Farm is where we're building movement and building a critical mass of leaders across generation and discipline. And I'm so sorry, I'm so glad you were engaged and I hope you'll bring more of them. We have programming year round. We're trying to put everybody through organizing training, but with a context of history and of movement building, which is what I think everybody needs to do. And all of us at the Children's Defense Fund are gonna go through organizing training now so that policy people will understand they need to know how to organize at a community level. So we're so glad. Um, that you are there and bring some folk next time and get the message out. But look at our website and see the different youth development programs and hopefully you will join us. Yes, sir. My name is Peter Eckstein. I wanted to ask you to speculate a bit about the potential impact of a, a Obama presidency over, let's say, the next eight years. Uh, laws, executive orders aside, what kind of an impact do you think it can have or will have on the African-American community in terms of uh, redefinition of possibilities in itself? You made some allusion to that, but maybe you could speculate. Oh, I think that already he's had an enormous impact. I mean, the yes, we can. I mean, to see this family in the White House, um, to see that this young man, and I say to everybody who was in other opposing camps, some of whom said this was affirmative action, I said it wasn't affirmative action. He out-organized you, he out-visioned you, visioned you, he out-strategized you, he, and every, he just beat everybody fair and square because he was smarter and he had more vision and he had money. And so he was an extraordinary moment, person sent and stepped up to the plate and I don't know anybody else who could have you know, been the right kind of role model and image. I think he sends an extraordinarily powerful message um, about, that can begin to break down the stereotypes about who black families are because we're a diverse community. Um, and I think that that family image in the White House has been as extraordinary for all Americans as well as for young black Americans and for all of us. Um, I think it's given a new sense of possibility, as I said through my example, the young fellow in the juvenile detention facility, he might actually be able to get a PhD instead of a GED. Um, and so I think it's, it's said, sent a message to children that um, I can and that I, you know, that, that even if I am biracial or even if I am, um, have an absent father or even if I had a mother who was on food stamps that I can make it too with hard work and good old core values. Um, and I think he has been using already in his campaign his bully pulpit to talk about how we all need to be paying much more attention to parenting, to turn off the TV set, um, to turn off the video games, to pay attention to homework, and to really focus in on helping children learn. Now there's some dangers. I heard a story the other day, because everybody's parent is saying, yes, you can. Don't use any excuses for telling me why you're bringing home these bad grades. But then I heard somebody tell, call me up and say, there's a man with a very seriously autistic child who was telling this child no excuses. And I said, you know, we can't carry this to the extreme, but, but the, the important thing is that we need to have these high expectations. We should use this incredible positive example for all of us, and I think it breaks down an awful lot of racial stereotypes as well. But I hope that we can also be clear about what we all have to do to enable him and enable our country to put into place the policies that children need in order to succeed. Because there's nothing worse than having these expectations up here and have them down here in schools with, 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 with skills um, and education levels that are down here. So we've got to use this as a moment. We all have a sense of what is possible um, to put into place the building blocks for success. But I think it's an enormous transformation. It's an enormous generational transformation. And I have loved watching the young people get engaged. I hope we can keep them engaged. Um, and hope that all that energy that went into electing him now will go into building the movement to, 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 to have a harvest um, for the policies that we need to have. Yes. Good afternoon. Thank you for your talk. Um, before I came back to work my PhD in social work, I did a fair amount of work in child welfare. And one of the things that led me to come back and study is the fact that um, we talk about kids, but we, we don't do well enough with parents either. Um, there's definitely culpability. We have all that language in child welfare policy and law 
but there's also the balance because many of these parents themselves were also victims. Yes. So how then as a future policymaker, as a future practitioner, as a future educator, do I not only for myself help to navigate that balance, but also to teach others to navigate it as well? Well, I think that um, I keep saying over and over again that children don't come in pieces, they come in families. We need to break the cycle, but we need to work with families and with parents. We need to prepare parenting. We need to deal with teen pregnancy prevention. And we need to try to help children, um, help parents do the decent job that most of them really do want to do and don't know how. And I think some of the most agonizing decisions that anybody can make is, is when to remove a child from a family. I mean, how do you balance all of that off? And certainly you should, though, not having children have children removed from families because parents don't have the income to keep them out of a homeless shelter. Um, and so much of what we can do, I think, is again by making sure that parents have those supports that enable them to do the better job than most parents want. They need to be able to make a living with a decent wage. They need to have childcare if they are working. And so not leaving children at home alone because they can't find children and therefore risking their children and put in the child welfare system. But we must try to keep them both together, make every effort to try to build and, and invest in the extended family network until parents can get themselves back on their, on their feet. But then we must, when children are at risk, and it's always a very hard thing, make sure that you're protecting children. But the main thing is to break the cycle. I mean, that's going forward. How do we put into place the building blocks for success um, for children before they reach these stages? How do we make sure that we're identifying children who are potentially at risk? in the prenatal stages um, and with good family support systems um, at the beginning. And so I think we should do everything we can to work with parents and with children and then to see what we can do to save the children if we are not able to keep the family together. But it's a very hard set of choices, but I think we must bear them both in mind. Children need their parents and need, their, need one reliable adult that they can count on. And that is certainly better than what we often have as options in foster care and in our group homes. So. But it's a hard set of questions, and I appreciate the sensitivity, and you just have to keep struggling. And we're trying to find a better balance in the law. Um, but more importantly, building in the support services to prevent removal and then to see how we can foster reunification. But if not, how do we find the best kind of adoptive families? Um, but these are very hard questions. But there's so much we could do if we had the systems we've been talking about in place. Yes. Um. My name is Eric Isham. I'm a first year MPP student at the Ford School. Uh, first of all, thank you for coming. Um, I've had a chance to listen to you a couple different times, and I, I'm just thrilled to every chance I get. Um, a couple times you mentioned extreme poverty, and some people would argue that in the United States we only have relative poverty and that we don't actually have extreme poverty. And furthermore, some people say that poor people in the United States really aren't that bad off. Um, so I have two questions. Um, first of all, what were the, was the threshold that you used for the extreme poverty for the 40%? And then the second question is, what can you say to kind of argue against that, that mentality that we only have relative poverty in America? Well, um, Sheldon is here, and you've got all your national poverty people who know these things, but we're talking about a basic um, wage of uh, um, 10000 or income of 10,000 for a family of four, half that is what we talk about is extreme poverty, 20,000 for a family of four, and it's in the book correctly. I have so many numbers running around in my head very often, and about half of that is extreme poverty. I mean, I think we all know that the minimum wage hasn't been indexed for inflation until this past year um, for a lot of people, um, and, um, and but we need to look more at how we can redefine what the poverty threshold should be. Um, in America because I think a lot of people who are living at the poverty level are not able to make ends meet and now there are big fights about whether you're including um, other benefits into this but the fact is that we've got millions of people who've been working hard every day with wages that have not kept pace with inflation and who are not able um, to afford a decent place to live um, who are not able to meet the most basic needs um, of their families if they are working because we don't have adequate child care supports, who are not able um, to afford health care. Um, the average family, assuming that um, you know, their employee, did, the family dependency cost of trying to cover your dependence is about $12,000. Well, that's about what a minimum wage job pays, um, and most people cannot afford that. 
and in most of our states, the fair market value of, 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 of rent exceeds the wages of many um, low-income minimum wage workers. And so I think we need to look hard at, at how we redefine the poverty threshold and how we provide a range of self-sufficiency <coughs> work supports. Um, but it's very clear that we've got food lines growing, we've got shelters growing, um, and shelters have become institutionalized, even though I don't think they're places for children. Um, but we've gotten used to it, and we're now setting up schools for homeless children, um, as, as, as if this is something that's going to stay with us. Um, but um, within the context of America, um, I think that we can do much better, and I think that we need to continue to have these debates. And I hope that this is a debate that we will continue to have with the kind of leadership out of your National Poverty Center here. Um, but that is at least a debate that we're beginning to have in a more robust fashion. But what is poverty here? The fact is the children are hungry, increasingly, and numbers of them are there, and those of us who work in soup kitchens or in homeless shelters see what is there. I watch children who have no homes, um, and something does not compute in here. So I think we need to look at the poverty threshold, but I also think we need to put into place the kind of work supports, um, and then talk about how we can create jobs at living wages that will allow people to um, be able to make the, meet the most basic necessities of their lives. Um, but th that's a conversation that must be continued. Um, let me uh, make a suggestion, since we're running out of time, but just two more speakers. Perhaps I could ask you both to give your questions Good. and then do a combined response. Good. Thank you. Um, thank you for being here. Hard work and inspiration. My name is Laura Sanders, and I am representing the Washtenaw um, Interfaith Coalition for Immigrant Rights. Just in our community alone in the last 10 months, we've had, we've, it's come to our attention that 26 of our families have been raided by Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Um, families have been separated. Children have been torn away from their parents. Violent things have happened in front of these children. Um, we have three children in foster care who have been, because their mother was taken right off the street and deported. Um, and this is re happening. We know this is the tip of the iceberg, what's coming to our attention. We know it's happening across the nation. And I'm wondering if you could comment on um, immigration reform that might help uh, meet the needs of our, our, particularly our Latino children, who, many, the, many who are here. The raids were stopped. They're inhumane, they are cruel, they're ripping children away from their parents. They should stop. And we should be speaking up against them. Um, I felt the same way when we used to look at you know, one of our early studies was of children of women prisons, and you would watch the police come in and rip parents away, um, and children didn't understand it, and leave children there without any supervision. I mean, this is tra traumatic and just un-American, and we should stop them, and we should sort of raise that. And we should begin to have a thoughtful debate about immigration policy. And the first thing we can do, though, is to begin with legal immigrants to see that I hope that they did include IKEA. Um, that we get health coverage for legal immigrant children, and we are in our All Healthy Children's Bill trying to get health care for everybody. But I do hope that immigration reform will be something that we continue, that we do something about and don't continue to avoid, because as you know, we have a paradoxical policy of encouraging as many to come in um, to provide cheap labor for employees, and then we punish those who do come in um, with these kinds of activities. So I hope that um, immigration reform will be early on the agenda of somebody and some of our leaders, but it will come because of the pressure. Um, from citizens. So, but the raids must stop. They're absolutely cruel and they're traumatizing students, children, and parents, and we should not permit it in America. Thank you. Yes. Um, prior to getting my PhD in community teaching in Michigan, I worked with your son Jonah with Stanford oh, Children. Oh. And I just wondered if there's still plans for June 1st to be an oh. annual day for things to happen, and wondered if there's some plans this year for something oh, to happen. Oh, Jonah and I have a big debate about he's into state and local organizing, and he's really trying to focus. He's at home tonight, so I hope I can get home tonight um, in Washington on um, how he can build grassroots efforts, and they're making a real difference in building up the city halls and county councils and really doing state initiatives to invest in successful children's programs. And I think that he doesn't think that our usual kind of demonstrations on June 1st, but you know, after the first June stand for children 1996, we did a June 1st in 1997, and that provided with 700 local stand for children days, that was the grassroots momentum that enabled us 
to draft and get enacted the CHIP legislation. Um, so I think that maybe we'll have to negotiate as to whether we can resuscitate June 1st as a day to stand for children, um, but I suspect he's going to want to do it in states and localities, and I'm going to want to do it nationally. So maybe we'll meet <laughs> somewhere in the middle as we try to bridge our either-or strategies, but I'm very proud of the grassroots stuff that he's creating, and I hope that will continue. Thank you, though, for what you did. Yes, ma'am. Current uh, U of M undergraduate student and also a foster care alumni of the system, so everything that you pretty much said I've gone through. Um, but one of my questions is, um, I'm graduating this year and I'm trying to um, work with the university and higher level institutions on actually being involved in creating, um, increasing numbers for foster care alumni to matriculate to colleges. And I wanted to know some of your recommendations on how to actually make that happen as an undergraduate student and uh, previous foster care alumni. Well, um, I want to make sure I, I understood the gravamen of what you were trying to say in terms of you trying to get the university to do what? I got the beginning and I got the end. Be involved in helping foster care um, kids in the communities um, matriculate to colleges and higher level institutions such as University of Michigan. Well, it's very important. And, I've been in just, and one of the things that we're focusing on in the cradle is how do we just figure out how to get the schools to, because when look at get children who are leaving foster care, um, how do we get the schools and how do we get the community to provide them the support so that they can stay in school and do well in school and be prepared to apply for places like the University of Michigan. But right now, and I think that that's one of those sub pieces of things as we're trying to, 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 to break out the cradle into manageable pieces for action while seeing the whole that we really have got to focus on is the support systems for children coming out of juvenile detention and the support systems for children who have been in foster care and multiple foster care systems. And I've watched, I had 12 foster sisters and brothers after I left home. And the supports that they need in order to succeed have to be there, um, either from their previous foster care families, but as you know, many of them are in multiple placements, um, from other mentors in the community, and I'm so pleased about the growing voice of, the, of organized foster care young people. Um, but we need to find ways of bridging that gap and, and making sure that they're able to graduate from school and get the kind of tutoring that they need and are able to find a welcome set of helps. Um, in our university so that they can get on a trajectory toward success. And I'd love to have you hook up with Mary Lee Allen and with our foster care network so that we can try to work with you. Thank you so much. So on behalf of all of us, our thanks to Mary and Wright Edelman for a wonderful afternoon of provocative um, thought and a call to action in such an important area. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us here this afternoon. We do have a short reception, so please stay and uh, interact with us for a little while. There'll be uh, drinks, I guess, on either side. Again, thank you very much for joining us for the Ford School's 2009 Reverend Martin Luther King uh, Jr. Memorial Lecture. City Foundation.